<laughs> okay, let's start up. Let's start up. How about that one? You like that one, huh? Matches my brain, doesn't it? All right, this is how most of you look when I walked into the room. <laughs> Actually, we shouldn't make fun of disease, but this is myotonic dystrophy, which is the most common adult muscular dystrophy. It's autosomal dominant. And it's an example of something that our, <clears throat> I think that uh, Rauschenbach, Reichenbach, whatever it is his name is, will talk to you about, and that's called a triplet repeat disease. That's where you get re repetition of trinucleotides. Okay, so let's say it was CAG. Let's say that was the, tri the, uh, the trinucleotide, and you just repeat it one right after the next. The same thing, CAG, 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 CAG. This keeps on repeating itself. That's called triplet repeats. And there are about four diseases that have that abnormality. They include Huntington's chorea, they include myotonic dystrophy, Friedrich's ataxia, and fragile X syndrome, okay, where you have mental retardation and macroorchidism, big testicles, usually uh, when they're adolescents. And they all have these, uh, these triplet repeats of the trinucleotide. It has a concept associated with it and that in future generations, the disease gets worse. That's called anticipation. In other words, you can anticipate that in, in, in your future generations of kin that the disease is going to get worse. And the reason for that is, is that for each time, each generation is more of those triplet repeats added on. And so you're coding for an even more defective protein. And so the disease gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. The way they ask the board question, to my knowledge, is that a counselor, a genetic counselor, is, is uh, telling these two, um, uh, this couple, uh, that they, they had a, a, a type of disease that if they were to have children then, that the disease would invariably be fatal in their children. Okay? Then it said that they didn't listen to their counselor and they had a child that lasted only one month and died. And so they asked what it was, and it was, uh, or they asked what was this an example of uh, a triplet repeat disorder, because they were coming in, probably one of those future generations had some kind of, had a, had a, tri a triplet repeat type of thing, which is going to get worse, and so this guy is saying now, you know, don't get pregnant because you're, you know, you're many generations ahead here. Chances are the baby would be very, very abnormal based on the fact of what disease you have, okay? And they didn't listen, and the, and the baby, and the baby died. So that's the way they asked that particular question. So that's called anticipation, and the the defect is called triplet repeats. Myotonic dystrophy is an example. Now, this has frontal balding, but that doesn't mean anything. This guy, unfortunately, has muscle weakness in his face, and that's why his mouth is drooped open. And that's how you usually see the teenagers. They usually start with, of course, most teenagers have their mouth like this. You know, Joey, what would you learn in school? <laughs> they all look like they have myotonic dystrophy, you know. But uh, <laughs> you can tell I really don't like teenagers. And... Um, and so that's how they usually start. But somebody was pretty clever on the boards and said that, uh, I think they actually had this picture up there, and they said this guy couldn't release his hand, his grip on his golf stick. That's the way they worded this thing. That's the uh, myotonic part of it. They have failure. Uh, they can't relax their muscle grip. So they're the kind of people that if you hand grip them, you know, you're going to have to pry it off with some kind of, with your foot, you know. <laughs> okay, because they're going to keep on gripping. They can't release. Uh, the uh, the grip on your on your hand that's a characteristic. They also have uh, diabetes. They also have uh, a, a cardiac abnormality as well. So it's a, it's a kind of a real group of syndromes. Myotonic dystrophy, triple repeat, anticipation are the key words you want to remember. Now most of you end up like this towards the end of the day, <laughs> and I kind of scream a little bit, and your eyes open a little bit, trying to make sure there's no fire or anything like that. Everything's doing fine, you know. And then it goes down again, okay? 
But uh, actually, she was like this uh, when she was in the neurologist's office. And then he did something, he injected something, and the next thing you know, her eyes opened and she felt a lot better with your diagnosis. Mycenae gravis. This is an autoantibody against acetylcholine receptor. It's an IgG antibody. And so that's an example of type 2 hypersensitivity, as is Graves' disease, which is an IgG antibody against the receptor. That, by definition, makes it type 2. Uh, whether you destroy the receptor or just block it is irrelevant. Acetylcholine can hook into it, and so you're going to get muscle weakness. The first muscles, usually, are the lids. And so they get lid lag, and they also get double vision because the muscles of the eye are also screwed up, and they get diplopia. Then eventually they get to stage for solids and liquids, and they'll say, I, I can't swallow, and they'll point right here that it's stuck right there. And uh, that's because that's striated muscle up there, and this disease is affecting primarily striated, not smooth muscle. And then eventually the muscle weakness progresses all around. It's a very bad disease. I had it not, I, my, it wasn't my secretary, but it was one in our department area. And she had it and actually made the diagnosis. I made the diagnosis because I noticed at the end of the day that she's just dragging around. And I said, your, your, your lids are dragging. I said, do you know that? She says, yeah, I noticed in my, I can't keep my eyes open. And I said, I said, uh, how's your vision? Right? Sometimes I get a little double vision, so. And she said, I just got back from the doctor, and the doctor said, I couldn't swallow. I couldn't swallow. And he said, well, you have globus hystericus. That's a terrible thing to say. What an idiot that doctor was. At any rate, um, I said, well, what about when you wake up in the morning? Feel great. Then what happens is the day progresses, feel bad. I said, can I suggest that you go to a neurologist? Okay. And so she did, and he did a tense mon test on it, positive, got reset the antibodies. They were positive. And made the diagnosis that she's not doing well. Here's a young lady, 32 years old, two kids, that is disabled. She's actually got disability insurance. And she's probably going to die because what happens is when all the receptors go, you can give all the acetylcholine esterase inhibitors you want. That's the treatment. By giving an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, you block the breakdown of acetylcholine, so you really build up that acetylcholine level in there. And so what few receptors you may have, you have a much greater chance of them hooking into it, that there's more acetylcholine there, and so they do well. But eventually, when there's no receptors, it doesn't really matter how much acetylcholine is in there, you're screwed. So then her only option would be, actually, um, and probably wouldn't do much good, as a thymectomy. So let's talk about the thymus as in the anterior uh, mediastinum, as you know. And a trick question is, what's the pathology? They could describe this. You know it's myasthenia gravis. And they can say, what would you expect to see in the thymus of this patient? And you're going to put thymoma down, and you could be wrong. Now, thymoma is a, is a malignancy of the thymus, but that only occurs in 15 to 20% of cases. What you actually see are germinal follicles in the thymus. That's T cell country. What's B cells doing there? They're the ones making the antibody. So the antibody is not made in your lymph nodes. The antibody is made in the stinking germinal follicles in your thymus. And so you can see why, doing a thymectomy, you're removing the antibody-producing tissue. And actually, one-third of people get complete cure, one-third get partial cure, and one-third and one don't go to any. And those are the ones probably that waited too long, okay, and they didn't have any receptors anyway. Okay, so that's the, that's, the, that's the myasthenia story. So don't pick thymoma is the most common uh, thing that you see. It's B-cell hyperplasia is the most common thing you see in the thymus. Okay? And that's where the antibody is being made. Myasthenia gravis. Okay, let's do some uh, collagen vascular disease. You all know this is a butterfly distribution of a rash on the face, but... Now, you can see that in eczema and all that stuff, so don't jump on that all the time. It could be just an excess amount of rouge on your face, too. Okay, you see these people who are kind of really dressing themselves up there, and you say, hey, do you know they got lupus? No, I don't. Okay. Just a couple key points on lupus. Uh, uh, of all the autoimmune diseases, it's the one that would most likely have a positive ANA. As a matter of fact, it's about 99% sensitivity. The two antibodies that you want to order when you have a positive ANA to prove that it's lupus, not something else, 
All right, now it's Smith antibody, which has 100% specificity for lupus. I hope you know what that means. That means if I did an anti-Smith antibody in this room, and one of you had a positive test, you have lupus. I don't even have to ask you any questions. I don't have to get a family history, you've got lupus. Because if it has 100% specificity, that means no false positives. So if it means if it has no false positives, and if it's positive, then obviously it's true. So it has 100% positive predictive value. The other one you get is anti-double-stranded DNA. And if that's positive, it not only means you have lupus, but it also means you have kidney disease as well. And that has about a, like a 98% uh, specificity and, and, uh, uh, as well. So that's why those are two good uh, antibodies to confirm the diagnosis of lupus. Morning stiffness is present in lupus. It, sim it simulates rheumatoid arthritis photophobia, the malar rash. Uh, what else? They get the pericarditis. Uh, all of these things one sees. This is an LE cell. Never order an LE cell prep. They're an absolute unequivocal waste of time. What they are is the uh, antibodies, anti-DNA antibodies, react against uh, DNA. And then the, what happens is the neutrophil phagocytizes those cells. And this is the DNA uh, in there. So it's a neutrophil and it's phagocytose. Uh, altered DNA. That's called an LE cell. It takes a long time to look for these, and it's not even specific for lupus. It's an absolute, total waste of time. So never order an LE prep. You will be hated by the laboratory. You will, you will have to change your name, okay, okay, because they will hate you for doing that. It's just a curiosity now, okay. What's this patient have? Got a very tight face. She's got some telangiectasia. She's got dysphagia for solids and liquids. She's got a classic Raynaud's phenomenon. You x-ray her hand, she's got dystrophic calcification all over the stinking place. She's got sclerodactyly. What's she got? Progressive systemic sclerosis. Or she actually could have Crest syndrome. You just have to, uh, you have to just find out which organs are involved. If kidneys are involved, which is very, very common in progressive systemic sclerosis, and that would be a Crest syndrome doesn't involve the kidneys. Okay, so sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a tough diagnosis to make which one it is, but irrespective, they're both bad. They're both bad diseases. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say on, on that. Okay, here's a patient that you've seen this one already. Remember, dermatomyositis with the raccoon eyes. Okay, uh, this is where they have elevated serum CKs. This one doesn't show it quite as well, the raccoon eyes, but it does show this little rash, not very good, that you see right over the, uh, the proximal and the phalangeal joints. It's kind of like a silvery rash that's called gold trans patches, uh, and this is dermatomyositis. This is the one that has the highest association with an underlying cancer. Okay. We already talked about Sjogren's syndrome in the context of rheumatoid arthritis and antibodies that destroy minor salivary glands, dry mouth, uh, and lacrimal glands, dry eyes. This is a biopsy of the lower lip, which is a confirmatory test, I might add, looking to see if there's an inflammatory reaction destroying the minor salivary glands, and you can see all these lymphocytes there. That would be considered confirmatory diagnosis. Sjogren's syndrome. The antibodies are anti-SSA anti-SSB, and it took me years. I said, what do the SSS stands for? This shows you how dumb I am sometimes. I mean, sometimes it may sound really smart, but I took about dumb. Finally, it dawned on me that SS stood for Sjogren's Syndrome. <laughs> I just, just couldn't believe it. They have another name for them now. Anti-SS, uh, A is anti-Rho, and anti-SSB is called La, and that came after the Sound of Music movie, so, I saw a female deer, la, so they decided, let's change SSA to anti rho and then SSB to anti la. Anybody know something else about anti rho antibodies? Patients with lupus can have this antibody too, and it can cross the placenta and attack the baby's conduction system. Okay, so patients uh, with lupus that have that particular antibody, SSA or anti rho, uh, there's an IgG antibody, and it can cross the placenta, and for some crazy reason, it attacks the conduction system of the baby, and you got a baby with uh, complete heart block. On occasion, that's asked on part one, a little bit more commonly on part two, actually. 
I'm only going to show you a couple skin zits, guys, because uh, part two is the skin zit test. <laughs> okay, a zit is, you know, lesion in the skin or a pimple. I'm going to show you the classic ones that I think are part one worthy. And you've seen quite a few already. I showed you basal cell carcinoma, so I don't think I have to show you another one of those. Okay, even though what histologically it looks like, I've shown you squamous cell carcinoma. Okay, lower lip and that little thing. I've shown you actinic keratosis, so you're aware of that lesion. You rub it off and it comes back. I've showed you even psoriasis. And so that's a silvery uh, uh, a lesion that's red and raised and has a silvery plaque. Someone was saying something about on, on her exam that there was this rash on the hands that had a silvery look to it. That was psoriasis involving the hands. It doesn't always just involve the, uh, the pressure points. And it actually involved the scalp. In fact, that's the most common location. People think they have, they have uh, um, dandruff, which is seborrheic dermatitis due to malassezia furfra. Uh, but in reality, it's psoriasis. Okay. Now, one exam I might mention on the psoriasis, there was a black person with psoriasis. So obviously, you're not going to see that reddish discoloration, but what's really going to stand out is a silvery, uh, the silvery thing. But a lot of people missed it. Okay. They just put, I don't know what the heck they would have put down on it, but if it's, you see a rash on the elbow, I mean, that's the classic pressure point area. I don't care if it's a Martian, a black person, white person, Far Eastern person, whatever person. It's psoriasis. It, it doesn't change the diagnosis. Guys, this is atopic dermatitis on this little child's face. This is how a kid with an allergic diathesis usually starts their disease. I'm really familiar with this. All my grandchildren got this. And so they get this eczema, or what they call atopic dermatitis. You can see this kid's mouth is open, probably as a mouth breather. It's type 1 hypersensitivity. This is a contact dermatitis. And this and that, the reason why they left the girdle on this woman, and that's because the contact dermatitis was to the metal in there, and that was probably nickel, which is a very, very uh, uh, substance that commonly develop a reaction. It is a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. Now, listen carefully. Listen carefully. This is how they ask these kinds of questions. They can say, they can show you this, and they say, the pathophysiology of this lesion would be equivalent to the pathophysiology of, pathophysiology of which is the following. And then they'll say wheel and flare reaction in someone with a scratch test, and they'll put all other crap down there. And then they'll put, say, positive PPD. That's the answer. Because this is type 4 hypersensitivity, and so is a positive PPD, type 4 hypersensitivity. They're pretty clever. They got two for one by that. You get two for one by that one. You have to know what this is, first of all. You got to know it's type 4 hypersensitivity. Then you got to know another disease that's type 4 hypersensitivity. <laughs> pretty clever. Pretty clever. Those guys are smart, but not smarter than you. <laughs> I don't think I agree with you, Dr. Gallion. <laughs> You've got a trumped up idea about how smart I am. Well, all right. This is seborrheic dermatitis. That's due to my... What a wonderful name for a fungus. Don't you think this would be a great name for your kid? Malassezia for, for Golion. It's got a nice... It's just... Uh, Goljan. Goljan now. What a wonderful name. I mean, how many people out there in the general public know that Malassezia purpura is a fungus? Not a whole lot. You know, then you get a whole lot of other people, and then you start a little Malassezia purpura cult, you know, and you got this whole conclave of people, and they meet every year, and you know, then all of a sudden they get the bad news from a, a mycologist that, you know, you're named after a fungus, and then all of a sudden these people are all in, you know, intensive psychotherapy. Okay, and they have issues against their parents and stuff like that, if you know what I mean. It could really be a downhill thing. So, guys, this is in an adult. And I just finished telling you it's Malassezia furfur. Are you worried about this since it seems to be pretty extensive? Oh, well, I would. I think about an immunocompromised disease. And this patient actually has AIDS. Ooh. So you're saying that disseminated cerebriac dermatitis due to malassezia furfur, is kind of a pre-AIDS, maybe, defining lesion. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yep. Now, here's a patient who's got this bald spot on their head. 
And so you use a black light, which remember is UVA light, and it fluoresces. What's your diagnosis? Microsporum canis, which used to be the most common cause of tinea capitis. But actually now it's trichophyton conturans is the most common one. And because the fungus involves the inner portion of the shaft, there's no fluorescent metabolites. It's, it's, a, it's a woods light negative. So remember, the most common cause of uh, tinea capitis, you know, superficial dermatophytes, I'm not sure you understand what I'm saying, is not microsporum canis anymore. It's trichophyton tonsurans. But I got really good news for you. This is going to be so cool. All the other superficial dermatophyte infections, including tinea corporis, which is what this is. You can see why they called it ringworm. If it was, it was a really dumb one because it kept going around in circles, kind of like a guy when he's trying to, you know, find directions. He ends up going to the same spot. They thought this was a worm going under here, okay? But, of course, it's a superficial dermatophyte infection. It's not a worm, even though they call it ringworm. So if you see kind of something like this with a red outer edge and a clear center, and they ask you what's your first step in the workup, the answer is to scrape the outside, do a KOH prep, which is this, and you see the hyphae and you see the yeast forms on that. All other superficial dermatophyte infections except tinea capitis are due to trichophyton rubrum. That's cool. That's cool because it isn't a whole lot to remember. And the way you're going to remember that, what color is that right there around that, that, uh, that uh, tinea corpus? What's the color? Red. What's rubrum mean? Red. That way you remember. Trichophyton rubrum. They like molluscum contagiosum, guys. It's a very, very common infection in children. And when they see these things, they kind of pick at them because they kind of have sandy-like material in the middle of this crater. And then they, they self-inoculate, and they get these things over and over and over again. It can last for quite a while. Anybody remember the name of the virus producing these? Pox virus. Okay, pox virus. So it's a, it's a DNA virus, actually. And it's, this is very, very common, molluscum contagiosum. Remember how, how the basal cell carcinomas were crateriform, kind of like a volcano-like thing? Just take that same kind of look, that volcano crateriform type of thing, and put it on the skin of a kid, and it's got sandy stuff in it, that's molluscum contagiosum. That's a viral infection. All right, now this is an inner and nice smile over here by this person. Uh, let's say this patient came in to you, and he said, I got this rash right on my butt. And, okay, he said, how did you know it was there? That's always an interesting question to ask. Okay, how did you do that? Did you have look backwards like that and all that? I mean, why are you looking at your butt for rashes to begin with? Okay. But anyway, here's this non paritic rash, okay, because it could be, you know, a little consult to a psychiatrist in this patient. And so we got this oblong looking thing with red on the outside, pale in the middle. You say, nah, this is tinea corpus, but it is kind of oblong looking as opposed to circular. But you go ahead and you do a KOH prep anyway because that's what Dr. Goyon said you should do. So you scratch. Nothing. Nothing. So what do you always do when you don't know what a skin it is? Topical steroids. And so you put topical steroids and it didn't go away. And about three days later the dude comes back and he's got this rash in the lines of Langer and a Christmas tree distribution on his trunk which he diagnoses. Pteriasis Rosia. You better know that one. It's not an infectious disease. This is a herald patch. This was kind of like a herald that harked the herald angels sing, a rash is about to come. Okay? So it has a lot of Christmassy things to it. Herald, Christmas tree, I mean, good Lord, common, 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 common board question. Okay? It is not a fungus. It is not a fungus. It's called Pteriasis rosia. Okay, now this is a precursor lesion for malignant melanoma. If you have more than a hundred of these nevi on your body, you have the dysplastic nevus syndrome. And it's very, very common. You see lots of people, they just have these brown jobbies all over their butt. My son's wife has got these suckers all over her, but she's got dysplastic nevus syndrome. You have to go to a qualified dermatologist once a year to have your whole body looked at.
because what they're looking for is one of these dysplastic nevi. Notice it's a little bit irregular. It's got some difference, a uh, little color differentiation, and it could be a precursor lesion for malignant melanoma. Dysplastic nevus. Very, very, very common. These are all the different variations of malignant melanoma. There's at least four different types. You've already seen this one. Part two would say, when they saw one of these, they'd say, what's your first step in management? The answer is excision. It's not a punch biopsy. It's not partial incision. It's excision. You remove the whole thing. This happens to be a superficial spreading malignant melanoma, which is the most common one. This is the one that you see commonly on older people, and it's always on the face. You see these very commonly, kind of fawn-colored lesions with irregular borders. Those are lentigo malignant melanoma. Of all the melanomas, that's the one that's the least likely to metastasize. And you see it on the face area. So that's a sun-exposed area, as you can see. Now, this is the killer right there. That's the killer. It's saying, I mean, that? Uh-huh. Yeah, that. Now, you know that the black population don't get malignant melanomas because the pigment in the skin prevents ultraviolet light damage and the propensity for cancers. But there is one type of malignant melanoma they can get. So here's your board question. You got a black individual who has a dyspnea. So they do an x-ray and they have multiple uh, metastatic lesions throughout the body. Biopsy is done and it's stated to be malignant melanoma. They'd say, which part of the body would you examine to find the primary disease? And the answer is, under the nails, palms, or sole of the feet. This is called acro, which means edge of, out, you know, tip of lentiginous malignant melanoma. This is the most aggressive of all malignant melanomas. So look under nails, palms, souls is where this one is. That has nothing to do with radiation. That's why the black population can get this one. Okay? This is what it looks like in the skin. And it actually, you can see why they think Paget's disease of the skin looks very, very similar to malignant melanoma. That look pretty similar. The other type is called nodular malignant melanoma. And, uh, and that's also pretty aggressive, too. The absolute most important thing determining prognosis is the depth of invasion. You don't have to know the Breslow, Wally Clark thing. Just know that depth of invasion is the key to prognosis. Magic number is 0.76. If you're less than 0.76 millimeters, there's no way it's going to metastasize. But if it gets below that, chances increase. So depth of invasion is a, is a key prognostic sign. I happen to like spiders, and so I put that in at the end of the derm notes. And they like spiders too, I might add. So here's your two poisonous spiders. Just to make sure that you get these, I let a couple of them go during the lunch period. So if you've been feeling something kind of crawly, a little itchy on your legs, it's not the person next to you. It's the real thing. Spiders are fascinating creatures. They really, really are. There's a lassoing spider that actually can take silk and lasso an insect. I mean, it's so unbelievable. Spiders. I enjoy them. That doesn't mean I pick them up and kiss them and play with them. No. Now, guys, this is a black widow spider, and that's pretty easy. It is black. Okay? But most people think the red hourglass is on the, on the dorsum. No, it's on the undersurface. So if you want to make sure and the spider is black widow, just pick it up and look on the undersurface to see if the hourglass is there. Why do you think it's called Black Widow? Because when the male mates with her, she eats the male. That, that's the truth. So they do mate cautiously, but for some reason or other, they're going to get eaten anyway. So it seems to be the thing, the old fight between the wasp and the tarantula. Okay, the wasp always beats the tarantula. It's just, I don't know what it is, genetic or whatever. And the same thing, the black widow, the female, always eats the male. What a life. It is a neurotoxin. And it produces, very commonly, spasm of the muscles in the upper thighs and abdomen. So strong, it's almost like tetanus. 
And sometimes the unwary person might think it's an acute abdomen and do surgery on it. Now, that's really dumb. So it's a neurotoxin that produces um, painful muscle contractions, particularly in the abdomen. There is an antivenom uh, for this particular disease, and it is a painful bite. Here's the way they ask it. They say that a person went down into their, into their cellar and lifted up some boxes in the back of the cellar and felt a sharp prick on their finger. Okay, and they say what was that, and then developed over a period of a couple hours, you know, uh, uh, contractions of the muscles in the thigh, and that's a black widow bite. So it is a painful bite. Now these dudes are a dime a dozen in Oklahoma. This is a brown recluse, otherwise known as a violin spider. And the reason why it's called violin spider, because there's the handle for the violin and there's the violin. And they actually do play this when they're moving around at night hunting, looking for something to bite. And so if you hear some kind of like Bach or something like that, okay, and it's kind of near your ear or possibly on your chest, okay, it's probably not your radio. It's a brown recluse about ready to envenomate you. And when they do so, it doesn't hurt actually. But it's a necrotoxin, not a neurotoxin, and it does a real big-time job of producing an ulcer in your skin, big-time. It's the most potent of all venoms in the world. You know, ounce for ounce, the venom of the brown recluse is more potent than a cobra, fer de lance, or anything you want to say. For that little size, it packs a, po a pile of stuff. They come out at night, as do most and I see these all the time in my house. I always thought every now and then I felt something crawl on me and I look and it wasn't. But then I wake up in the morning, there's one on the wall or something like that. They're all over the place. So if you leave them alone, they usually you lose, you leave you alone. So neurotoxin for black widow, necrotoxin for brown recluse. Okay? Uh, very interesting spiders. I just wanted to show you this. They had a schematic of skin on one person's examination, and it actually had two questions. One said to point to the structure responsible for piloerection. Okay? And so that had to be the erector muscle, the, the, the muscle, and so the answer was this. That produces like, you know, the, when the hair goes up, um, it's this muscle, erector pili. So that was the answer to that. And why that's important, I have no idea. Then the other one dealt with where is the receptor for androgens uh, in the skin. And the answer to that is the sebaceous glands. They have androgen receptors, and that's where um, testosterone or dihydrotestosterone hook into. See, the reason why men more likely get, get zits, get... get uh, 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 pimples, acne, is because we have more testosterone than women. Therefore, we have more that stimulates the sebaceous gland to release that lipid-rich material, which gets into this hair follicle. And then if you have propionobacterium acnei, that's an anaerobe in the skin, it has lipases that break down that fat from the sebaceous gland and produces uh, 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 fatty acids that irritate the follicle. Voila, you end up with acne acne. So men are more likely to get it because we have more testosterone. So the two areas they seem to be interested in is erector pili, piloerection, and sebaceous glands because that's what the androgen receptors are. Who could tell me the name of the drug that can be used in preventing hirsutism? Very good. Spironolactone, the same drug that you can use to block aldosterone is excellent for treating hirsutism because it blocks the androgen receptors say that is correct. If that's true, then what other thing can spironolactone do in a male? Gynecomastia, very good, very good. <laughs> Trevor did a good job. We're on CNS. This last topic before we do our little quiz. Whoa, he said quiz, I'm nervous. I'm nervous, do I have to write anything down? No, you don't. I have to write anything down. And what do I do? Just pay attention. Golly. Central nervous system. No, you don't have this schematic. It's a netter one. I hated netter things because I thought they were too busy. They were all small writing. They have all these stupid things all over the place. But this is a great one. 
for describing a couple, just some generalities, some big picture stuff, big picture stuff, okay? Let's first talk about spinal fluid. Ooh. Where does that derive from? Choroid plexus, which are in the ventricles. And so this is choroid plexus up here. We have it in the lateral ventricles and the third ventricles. We have it in the fourth, too. And it's an ultrafiltrated plasma. Let's stop there. Ultrafiltrate. So what's the difference between serum, let's say, and spinal fluid? Is there a difference in protein? Oh, big time. We're talking about grams per deciliter in serum. We're talking about milligrams per deciliter. And we're talking about spinal fluid because it's an ultrafiltrate. How about cells? There's hardly any cells in spinal fluid. In fact, if you see one neutrophil, that's abnormal. And so there's, there's no cells, really, in, in spinal fluid. How about glucose? It's lower. It's about 60% of what your serum is. So if my, my serum glucose was 100, it should be about 60 milligrams per cent. What if it was 20? And that'd be low. That means that I have something in my spinal fluid that's utilizing it for energy, like bacteria or fungus or cancer cells. They can all eat your glucose up. How about um, anything more in spinal fluid than serum? Chloride. Chloride is actually way higher in spinal fluid than it is in um, serum. Talking about uh, 120s. Now, why would they ask you this on an examination? Because, you know, they get injuries to the head area. For example, you've got a baseball hit you in the eye, you get an orbital blowout fracture. You could potentially break your cribriform plate, and you can have some dripping fluid out of there. Is that snot? Is it serum? Or is it spinal fluid? For me, it would probably be snot, because I'm always drooling down there, okay? And so there you'd have to know what are the differences then between the two. Or you can get whacked in the head, let's say... Uh, Kids practicing baseball, and they don't watch a kid, and they whack a kid right over here. Okay, and then you know, the next thing you know, there's some fluid coming out of the ear, otorrhea. Okay, and then they get the uh, hemorrhage back here. That's called battle sign. And, uh, you know, what is that? And then that's a fracture of the basilar, you know, plate. And you can end up with, uh, well, with the spinal fluid there. So that's why they want you to know that. Well, most of it's made up here, and it comes to this very dangerous area right over here. This is called the aqueduct of Silvius, and this is the most common cause of, of a hydrocephalus in children because this gets blocked off, and so you get a buildup of spinal fluid in the third ventricle and lateral ventricle, and so that will cause hydrocephalus. And you can see why. That's a very, very narrow area. Okay, then it comes down into the fourth ventricle and has to get out because we need to get into the subarachnoid space. And so you have the frame of Lushka Magendi. And so fluid goes out there into the subarachnoid space. Let's make sure you know those membranes. The dura, from which the word durable, or dura, I guess, came from the word durable, let's put it that way, means strong, durable, right? It's tightly adherent to periosteum. It's not loosely adherent. When we do autopsies, we have to use a plier to pull off the dura from the skull. So when we have an epidural hematoma, which means that you have a blood clot between the bone and the dura, and that is usually tightly adherent, and obviously the only pressure that could do that and split that away is arterial pressure. Okay, so that means that's the one that you rupture the middle meningeal artery in the bone, and under arterial pressure, you can split the periosteum away from the dura. Certainly not venous. No way, Jose. See the way I rhyme that? No way, Jose. That's very cool. I'm very good at poetry. <sighs> okay, now, it gets in the subarachnoid space, and its main reason is for men. Why? Because we're always banging our head when we don't know something, and so we don't, God didn't want us to get concussions all the time, okay? But actually, that's its main purpose, is to protect our brain and spinal cord from injury. It serves no other purpose. No nourishment, no nothing, just basically a cushion uh, against damage. So, since it's always being made, we've got to get rid of it, too, and we get rid of it through the arachnoid granulations, which are up here. There is a tumor that derives from that, and that's called meningiomas. Okay, it goes through the arachnoid granulations, and since there are no lymphatics in the brain, it goes into the dural sinuses, and they all eventually conglomerate down into the jugular vein, and that's emptied into the right side of your heart. 
So that when you do a Valsalva, okay, on your neck veins to spend, that pressure transmits all the way back into the dural sinuses, to the arachnoid granulations, through the spinal fluid, right down to that needle that you have in the subarachnoid space at L4. And it goes up, the pressure. That's called Quickenstead maneuver. It's a great test when you're doing a spinal tap to see if the entire subarachnoid space is patent. If you don't see that manometer go up, then there's something blocking the, uh, the spinal fluid more proximally. Okay. This is why they always warn you when you weight lift, never hold your breath when you're exercising because the pressures in your spinal fluid are incredible. A lot of times the disc will herniate uh, from that. Okay. So that's the spinal fluid story. Is there anything else I want to say uh, related to this? Just one thing in terms of tumors. This is the uh, tentorium cerebelli. And 70% of tumors of the brain in adults are supratentorial. So in other words, they involve the cerebral cortex, whereas the same percentage, 70% of primary tumors in the brain in kids are infratentorial, most of which are cerebellar, cystic astrocytoma, medulloblastoma. Let's talk about hydrocephalus. Let's talk about communicating and non-communicating. Now, here's another thing that screwed me up. I didn't know what that meant. I mean, I thought, of these walkie-talkies? I mean, who's communicating here? What the heck are they talking about? And a lot of times they assume that you understand it. Actually, they don't. They don't either understand it, the people that write, because now that I write, I know that when something doesn't make sense that I write, it's because I don't know what I'm writing anyway, okay? And that's usually what's happening. Well, what they're talking about, communication of the spinal fluid in the ventricles with the subarachnoid space. That's what they're talking. That's the communication. So we have communicating types of hydrocephalus and non-communicating. So let's deal with the most common one, non-communicating. What does that mean? Something's preventing spinal fluid from the ventricles from getting into the, to the uh, subarachnoid space. It's not communicating. Well, we already know the most common one is the, is the, uh, is the um, uh, aqueduct of sylvius is stenosed. I mean, one other obvious one would be something going on here in the, in the fourth ventricle, maybe an ependymoma. That's the most common location for an ependymoma in kids, the fourth ventricle. That would block it off. Or we can have a meningitis at the base of the brain, something like TB. It's famous for this. And you get a lot of scar tissue here and, and, and block the foramen of Lushka and Legendi. So those would be causes of non-communicating hydrocephalus. Now, communicating is not all that common. That means they're, they're still communicating, but there's still a buildup of pressure. Well, that's, that limits it, okay? One cause could be that you have a benign tumor of the choroid plexus, and they're all papillary looking. So if you had this tumor there and of the choroid plexus, then you would be doing, then there'd be a greater ultrafiltrate of plasma, and you'd be making more spinal fluid. And there'd still be a communication with here, Okay, but the pressure would build up because you're making more than you normally do. So that could be one reason. But more commonly, what if you, what if you had a uh, subarachnoid bleed or a meningitis up here, you scarred off the arachnoid granulations, then you'd have no way of draining it out. Okay, so, so you've still got a communication here, but you can't get rid of it. That's the most common one. Okay, all right. All right, let's do this. Let's say I grab this this uh, spinal cord and I pulled it down like that. Okay, that would bring the medulla into the cervical region, maybe a little piece of cerebellum. What's the name of that malformation? Arnold Chiari syndrome. That's where you got the medulla and a little bit of cerebellum uh, in the cervical area. You get platabasia and hydrocephalus. What if, what if this whole area of the, of the cerebellum, this is called cerebellar vermis, this whole area never developed, including the fourth ventricle. What's that called? Dandy Walker syndrome. Good. You had Nandan, Nandan Bhatt. Good. He's a neurosurgeon. Okay. Herniation. We're not talking about indirect inguinal hernias. We're talking about herniation here. I always have to always point to areas. I don't know why I do that. You know, that kind of stuff. You know, you know that that kind of stuff. It's crazy. I just don't know why I do it. I guess. I'm very, very, I want you to see it, to remember it, but that's kind of crazy, actually. Well, 
why would we herniate in the brain? Because we have cerebral edema and it's got no other place to go. And the famous ones are, of course, the uh, herniation, what they call tonsillar herniation, okay, into the foramen magnum. You know when you had your tonsils removed? You know, when you had your tonsils removed, it, it wasn't actually your tonsils. It actually was a neurosurgeon, if you check your records out. You actually had brain surgery. And they were taking out the cerebellar tonsils over here so that you couldn't herniate your brain. I know that they told some of you are actually believing this. This is really, really sad. This is really, really bad. Well, this is cerebellar herniation. I think you can see... That, that this part of the cerebellum has been squeezed into the foramen magnum and you've got this, this kind of constriction around it. You're going to die in about a split second with something like that, but this is the one they like. And that's uh, uncle herniation. Uncle herniation is where the uh, medial portion of the temporal lobe, which they call the uncus, herniates through the, uh, the superior, or what do they call that? Uh, this, well, I just mentioned it just before, the tentorium cerebelli, herniates through it and so it's pressing against your midbrain. That's not a cool place for a brain to press against because notice it caused hemorrhage in there. These are called deraised hemorrhages. That's not a good place to hemorrhage. But that's also a nerve that's going to be compressed. Who am I? Oculomotor nerve, okay? So what will you have? Well, you're going to have some ophthalmoplegia because the oculomotor nerve innervates everything except the lateral rectus, which is six, and the superior oblique, which is four. Is that correct? All the other ones. So. When your oculomotor nerve palsy, how do you feel right now and now? Do you feel down and in or down and out? Down and out. So oculomotor nerve palsy is down and out. If you look at the pupil, that's the way you determine where, 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 where it is. It'd be down and out. So your pupil would be down and out this way, lateral. That's oculomotor nerve palsy. Down and in, down and in like this, down and in is uh, trochlear nerve, fourth nerve is out. If you have lateral rectus, it's going to go in like that. Okay, you're going to look cross-eyed. You better know all of those because they put schematics and they put little dots representing the pupil. And you have to, you know, they'll show them down and out. And they'll say, and then they'll give some clinical scenario. And you have to pick out which, which way your pupils will be. They even had an MRI of the orbit. And they had to name the muscles. Whoa. Okay. Well... So you're right, but there's also the parasympathetic nervous system, right, that goes along with that. And so let's think about the pupil. Now, parasympathetics do what to the pupil normally? Constrict it, whereas sympathetics dilate it. So if you screw it up with the parasympathetics, which normally constrict, then what will happen to the pupil on that side? Metriasis. And actually, when I'm my reading on this, when I was doing one of my book things, um, the, the first sign of uncle herniation is metriasis of the pupil on the side of the herniation. And that's why they're always, neurosurgeons are always looking in the pupils and seeing what's going on. They see one side starting to dilate in someone with, with a cerebral injury, they know they have, there's a potential uncle herniation. So it dilates on that side. There's also an artery here that can be compressed. Can Mike tell me what that is? Posterior cerebral so they can get occipital lobe infarction. You can see why they like this one. Guys, uh, if you've been looking at my high yield, you know that they've been putting a brain stem, uh, an actual brain stem on there, and they're labeling every single cranial nerve. And you have, and what they do is give you some clinical scenario. You have to pick out which of the cranial nerves it is. So you better know where all the cranial nerves on the brain stem arise from. Cold. Cold. Because they've asked everyone from 1 to 12 on the test. Every single one of them. What's this called if you looked in the eye? Papilledema. Okay? Papilledema. Of course, any cause of increased intracranial pressure can do that. You normally you see a, a sharp margins to the disc. You don't see them here. This is papilledema. It's a sign of increased intracranial pressure. Who could tell me a vitamin toxicity where you could get something like this? Vitamin A toxicity. Very good! And who can tell me a heavy metal toxicity that can do this? Lead poisoning. Let me get increased vessel permeability. Remember the reason for that was delta amino levulinic acid. Let's break.